job. She's nothing but a bother. Why do you always believe him? Oh, don't you talk to your aunt like that? You wicked child. You should be grateful that you're Thank not in the poorhouse with all the other again. orphans. Hungry, oh, dying in there. Oh, no one's She must be left entirely alone. Now stay there. Now then, what are you doing under there? Come on. Leave your dolly behind. There's someone downstairs wants to see you. Me? Your name, little girl? Jane Eyre, sir. Well, Jane Eyre, are you a good child? <laughs> Perhaps the less said on the subject, the better, Mr Brocklehurst. Do you know where naughty little girls go after their death, hmm? To hell, sir. And what is hell? A pit full of fire, sir. And would you like to fall into a pit full of fire and burn for all eternity? No, sir. So, what must you do to avoid it? I must keep in very good health, sir, and not die. Oh! You see her impudence, Mr. Brocklehurst. What did I tell you? She needs proper discipline. Say you will admit her to Lowood School, Mr. Brocklehurst. Mrs. Reed. And tell the teachers to be very strict with her. Tell them she is deceitful. I am not deceitful. When have I been deceitful? You are. Listen to how she speaks to me. If I were deceitful, I should say you were the dearest, kindest aunt, and that I loved you. Bessie. Child. How dare you speak to your benefactress in that way? Take her away. I'm glad you are no relation of mine. I will never, never call you aunt again. <gasps> and if anyone ever asks me how you treated me, I will tell them that you locked me in a room and were cruel and horrible to me. I was ten years old when I left Gateshead. I'm glad to be parted from my cruel aunt and cousins who made me feel in every way unwanted and unloved. Even though I had no idea what Lowood School would be like, at least I would meet new people, hear about the world, and there would be a chance for happiness. Jane Eyre? Yes? Welcome to Lowood. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Go on, Jane.
get up for your Miss Breakfast? Your uniform's on the end of your bed. Breakfast? Breakfast consisted of a meagre amount of inedible porridge. In fact, everything about Lowood was terrible. The cold dormitories, the icy water we had to wash in, and worst of all, most of the teachers were harsh. Punishment and humiliation were part of the daily ritual. However, I had found a friend, Helen, who was loving and wise. Sometimes life is cruel, and we have to accept that. We'll be forever in torment. Je vais, je vais, tu vas, now girls, tu where vas, are the Americas? And where are the West Indies burns? Sit back down. All rise for Mr. Brocklehurst. Girls, we're very privileged today because Mr. Brocklehurst has brought his wife. Careless girl. Slates cost money, girl. Come here and bring your stool. It was just an accident, Mr. Brocklehurst. Put it down. Now stand on that stool. Now, girl! Teachers, children, you all see this girl before you. God has graciously given her the shape he has given to all of us. Yet who would think that the evil one had already found a servant in her? You must guard against her. Shun her example. Avoid her company. You must watch her, scrutinize her actions, punish her body to save her soul. Spring came, and with it the typhus. It raged through the crowded schoolrooms and dormitories. Neglected colds and semi-starvation made the pupils vulnerable to the disease. And those of us who were left waited and prayed that we and our loved ones would be spared. He's out there again. Not at the moment, Jane. She's just had a bed bath and she's resting. Is she getting better now? Temple! Well, Brian's convulsing and she's got the rash. Nurse! Is that you, Jane? Yes. I've been every day to ask if I can see you. I've been waiting outside the door. I wanted so much to see you. Miss Temple said you were very poorly. But I'm in no pain. I haven't slept for worrying that I'd never see you again. Oh, Jane. Helen? Don't be friend. I'm not friend. You're cold. Cover yourself in my quilt. We'll rest together. I'm so happy, Jane. Don't leave me. I won't. We'll always be together. Forever. Where are you taking 
taking me? Please let me stay with Helen. I'm sorry, Jane. Helen has died. No! No! I missed Helen so much, no one could take her place. Is that your friend, Miss Eyre? Yes, Anna. That was Helen. I remained at Lowood for a further eight years. Six as a pupil and two as a teacher. Who will bring my cloak and bonnet? Me! Hello. I was desperate for change. I wanted to see more of the world. I longed for liberty. I placed an advert in the Herald. Young lady, Accustomed to tuition, qualified in the guidance of pupils under the age of 14, seeks post. I had only one reply. Thank you. Mrs Fairfax? Yes, my dear. Welcome to Thornfield. Drive on. You must be tired after such a journey. Cook is preparing you a light supper. Thank you. Do you think I could meet the young Miss Fairfax this evening? The young who? My pupil. Oh, you mean Adele? <laughs> Little Miss Varons. Oh, she's not my daughter. <laughs> she's from France, God help us. Did I not tell you in the letter? She's Mr. Rochester's ward. Who is Mr. Rochester? Mr. Rochester, my dear. Why, he's the owner of Thornfield. But I thought you were the owner of Thornfield. Me? Oh, what a thought. No. <laughs> I'm the housekeeper. What a thing. When will I meet Mr. Rochester? When, indeed. When he decides to grace us with his presence, that's when. Which is not often. He's a restless soul. No sooner here than he's off on his travels again. Such a shame, because the young Miss Varons behaves herself when he's here. How many rooms are there? Oh, too many. But yours is a nice size. Not too big and drafty, like some of them. And how many floors? Two and a third in the West Wing, but no one uses that anymore. It's all locked up. Two floors is quite enough to manage. Here we are. It's all aired. So. Mrs. Fairfax! Hey. Oh, look at this. What are you doing up at this time? Oh, pardon, madame. Viens ici tout de suite. C'est la ma gouvernante? Oui. Uh, Je viens juste arriver. To a Francaise. English, please. It's hopeless. I can't understand a word you're saying. Vous parlez ma langue aussi bien que Monsieur Rochester. What did I Je say pour... in English, if you please, seeing as we're in England? Adele asked if I was to be her new governess and complimented me on my French. As good as Monsieur Rochester. Right, let's get her back to bed now, Sophie. She can see Miss Eyre in the morning. Good Come night. along now, do as you told. Good me, Adele. <laughs> if there's anything you need, just let me know. Thank you. Good night. I was relieved to find Mrs. Fairfax so friendly and little Adele clearly full of life and affection. I was filled with a sense of well-being. I felt surely I would be happy here.
The door's locked. I heard someone laughing. I thought Adele had... That'll be Grace Poole, one of the servants. She likes a tipple this time of night. Sends her quite giddy. I'll speak to her. But Grace Poole was not one to be hushed. I heard her strange laughter again over the months that followed, but I was yet to meet her, for she chose not to dine with the other servants. It's very good. I cannot do it. The paint goes everywhere. Well, then use less water. Little Adele had no great talents, but she made reasonable progress, and life at Thornfield was tranquil. Too tranquil. I should have been more thankful, but instead I felt restless and stifled. I felt sure there must be more to life than this. I'm all right. What were you doing looming out of that mess like a witch? You're a mad woman. Do you want me to go and get some help? No, no. Come here, I want you to help me out. I'm not sure that's the correct thing to do. Your leg might be broken, sir. I can fetch someone from where I live at Thornfield. It's just at the bottom of the lane. No need for that. It's just a sprig. Come here. Come on, for heaven's sake, woman. Give me your arm. How long have you been living at Thornfield? Since I took up post as governor. <sighs> and what, pray, is a governess doing out this time of the evening? Walking, sir. Well, before you carry on with your walk, could you get me my whip? It's there. Certainly. Thank you. Give my regards to Mr. Rochester. Come on, pilot. I've yet to meet him. She's laying the fire. Well, the, the fire can wait till John gets back with the surgeon. The bed needs airing now, and he wants to see Adele. Oh, but she sleeps. Well, wake her. Oh, how get out of here. Go on. Go on. Down. Get out of here. Go on. Get downstairs. It's pandemonium enough to wrap the nerves. Look, fetch Miss Adele and tell the cook to find a knuckle bone for the house. Oh, yes, Miss Eyre. The master wants to see you at once. What master? Mr. Rochester. He's had an accident. His horse fell, his ankle sprained. But he said he wants to see you as soon as you come in. So take your coat off. Change your frock, dear. He's asking for you. He's in the drawing room. Tell Leah to use the coals from my room. Yes, Mrs. Fairfax.
Ah, the helpful governess, Miss Jane Eyre. Come in. Don't hover by the doorway. I won't bite you. Fear you might deceive me. Only by omission. I was angry with you for bewitching my horse. I was simply walking? Yes, yes, in the mist. All right, it's done now. Be seated. I said sit down. Not there. There. Well, I can see you. So, where do you come from, Miss Eyre? Lowood School in Yorkshire. I advertised and Mrs. Fairfax wrote to me. Did she indeed? Well, I hope you're suitable. No doubt you're full of Brocklehurst's religious claptrap. Believe the man to be no less than a saint. I do not. Indeed, I dislike Mr. Brocklehurst. Oh, careful, that sounds like blasphemy. He is a harsh and pompous man. But I have studied the Bible since and have found my own faith in the Lord. And what faith do you place in arithmetic and geography? I have taught classes of 12-year-olds, Mr. Rochester. And for your information, I have also studied history, music, art and French. Very impressive. I did not tell you to impress. It is a fact, that is all. Oh, a fact, I see. So, can you play? A little. Yes, that's what all the schoolgirls are taught to say. Well, go on then. Play a little for me now. Show me. Attention, mon pied. Are you going to play, Monsieur? So, have you been a complete brat while I've been away, or have you been good? J'étais très très sage. Demandez à Sophie, Mademoiselle. Est-ce que c'est vrai, Sophie? Ah oui, Monsieur. Bon. Bonsoir. Merci. Bonsoir. Think of your new governess. She makes me work very odd, but I like her. Mm -hmm. Do you have a present for her? I don't know if Miss Eyre likes presents. Do you like presents, Miss Eyre? I have little experience of them, Mr. Rochester. They're generally thought pleasant things. I like presents. Really? What a shame, then, that I forgot to bring you one. Carry on, Miss Eyre. Here we go, sur le piano. Okay. I think that's enough piano playing for one evening. Clearly, you do play only a little. I'm sorry if my playing offends. Et voilà. All right, all right. Where are you going, Miss Eyre? To my room, sir. I see. So tiresome you used to leave me already. Never mind. Go on, go to your room. Voilà, torn. Yeah, of course, une fois. A big drop. I saw little of Mr. Rochester in the days that followed. He was either engaged in business or dining with friends. that a room on the third floor had a light burning in it when Mrs. Fairfax had told me that all the rooms up there were locked. Don't 
told her if she can't do the job, I'll find someone else who can. Is it Miss Paul again? Afraid so. The master's had a word, though. She's had her last warning. Perhaps if she were to mix with the other servants, she would not take to the drink, sir. Maybe loneliness is the cause of her misery. If I could speak with no, her No, 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 no. The master forbids it. She's a nasty piece of work, if ever there was one. Then why does he tolerate her? Because he feels sorry for the poor wretch. She's been with the family since his father's days. He'd not see her in the poor house. He's too generous by half, if you ask me. And how is he today? You can ask him yourself. He's requested you join him after supper. Leia! Fires in the drawing room now. Yes, Mrs. Fairfax. You examine me. You find me handsome, Miss Eyre? No, sir. <laughs> a direct answer for a direct question. I didn't mean to say. I'll try to modify your answer. It was an honest reply. Sit down. So, what faults do you find in me? Does my nose not please you? It's not... Or are my eyes too close no, set? No. Or is it that my it's ears are too large? Or my forehead's not too It is too a large? fine forehead. I have... Appearances of little consequence. It is the person within that is the attraction. Oh, I see. Well, it's my character that you find unattractive. What I meant to say was, certain facets of your character are somewhat unpleasant. I'm listening. You ask by way of command. Do I? Yes. Well, that's because I have a lifetime of saying, do this, and it's done. What else is wrong with my character? That is all. Are you sure? I'm sure. And do you expect me to change my manner because of one little governess? Well? I expect nothing, sir. You asked a question and I merely answered it. But you do understand that I have the right to be masterful in my own house. And after all, I've travelled the world. I'm much older and wiser than you are. Do as you please, sir. That is a very irritating reply, Jane. And you haven't answered my question. Surely your claim to wisdom and maturity depends on the use you have made of your time and experience. Really? How interesting. Oh, you smile. What are you thinking about? Only that very few people would care what their employees thought about them. Especially when they pay them £30 a year. Oh, yes, I forgot about the salary. Well, then. I have a perfect right to command you. With respect? Yes, of course. With respect. You are a rare breed, Miss Hare. Thank you, Mr. Rochester. I will take that as a compliment. Over the next few weeks, we had several stimulating conversations. And I found myself waiting for the next opportunity to be with him. Is it Adele's mother who makes you unhappy? Adele's mother was a French opera dancer. She was extremely beautiful and vivacious. And I was so flattered when she professed to love me, ugly mortal that I am, that I showered gifts on her, almost ruining myself into the bargain. But when she told me she was with child, I was thrilled. And at that moment, I had no doubt that the child was mine. So you were married to her? She was your wife? No. But she was my grand passion. I was besotted with her. I longed to be in her company, smell her perfume. One night, I called to see her unexpectedly at the hotel. She wasn't there, but I was 
quite content to wait for her on the balcony, thinking I would surprise her. Only I was the one to be surprised. For when she returned, dressed from head to toe in the satin and jewels I had bought her, she had with her a brainless young officer. I hid myself in the shadows, and I watched. And I felt such pain. Have you ever been jealous, Jane? No, sir. I thought as much because you have never felt love. Your soul sleeps. But there will come the day when you find yourself totally helpless. A fragile wreck in a storm of emotion. You make love sound unpleasant. It is all consuming. And when it is reciprocated, it brings the greatest pleasure. And I do believe we all have a right to get some pleasure from this life, don't you? So you thought you'd drown me as well, didn't you? I'll call Mrs. Fairfax. You'll do no such thing. What could she do? I found this on the floor outside your room. I heard a scratching at my door. I thought Pilot must have broken free from his leash. You're trembling, Jane. Come and sit down. You want to leave me already after you've just saved my life? Do as you're told and sit down. Here. Keep warm. I'll be back in a moment. Why do you keep her here? And why does she hide herself away upon the third floor? Does she mean something to you? Is Grace Poole another one of your grand passions? Grace Poole? She drinks 
and laughs loudly. She disturbs me. I have asked Mrs. Fairfax about her, and she told me that she has been with you for a long time. Grace Poole is one of the servants, Jane. Yes, well, she might have killed you. But you were there to save me. You were my guardian angel. I knew you'd do me good the first day we met. I could see it in your eyes. The expression, the smile was so lovely. And now I'm in your debt. There is no debt. Good night, sir. Where are you going? Back to my chamber. Not without taking leave. Look at me, Jane. Are we suddenly strangers again? Are we? Take my hand. I can't. Am I so repulsive to you? No. Even strangers shake hands. Such a little warm, delicate. Oh, I did not sleep that night. All I could think of was him. I thought surely today of all days he would call into the library to see how Adele was progressing and not make me wait till evening to see him again. Very good. Now you can choose a book to read. Your faces are pink, Miss Air. It's too warm in here. Perhaps we shall read outside in the garden today. No, it's too cold in the garden. Good morning. Thought you might like some lemonade and some cook's biscuits, seeing as you didn't come down to breakfast. I wasn't hungry, and I, I thought you'd all be busy with Mr. Rochester's room this morning. Oh, bless me, that was all done and dusted by half past six. Did Mr. Rochester tell you how Grace Paul set light to his bed? Well, he told me there was a little incident with the candle. Here you are, dear. Thank you. It was Grace Poole. She did it deliberately. Ask Mr. Rochester to tell you. Yes, well, I would if he was here, but he left at the crack of dawn. Left? Where to? Well, for, for the Ingrams. And he didn't have any breakfast either, gallivanting off without a morsel inside him. It isn't right. Who are the Ingrams? How far do they live and when will he be back? No, oh, all these questions have me dizzy. Expect to be gone for some time. And a fashionable lot, society folk. Live over the other side of Milk, about ten miles off. Oh, the theatres, parties, drinks, dinners. Mr. Rogers is very popular with the ladies. What ladies? The Ingrams, all three of them. Oh, they're an elegant bunch. But Blanche Ingram, well, she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Her face is... Well, bless me, it's like a painting, and her clothes are... Well, all I can say is they're magnificent. Is she not married, then? No, not yet. Although the family comes from money, I reckon there's no great fortune left. Between you and me, I, I think she's got a soft spot for Mr. Rochester. She'll not let him back within the month. Sure you're feeling well? Look very peaky to me. Will he be away for a long, long time again? I think so. He's staying with some fashionable people. I'm fashionable. Yes, you are. Mr. Rochester sometimes needs the company of grown-up ladies. But you're grown-up. Yes, I am grown-up. But I'm just a plain governess. 
would be foolish to think that Mr. Rochester would want to be in my company. It would be ridiculous. I miss him so. Come here, little one. We have to absorb ourselves in our studies. And the time will soon pass. Mattresses turned, the, the uh, silver dipped, the brass is rubbed. Yes, ma'am. The master's coming home. <gasps> oh, and he's bringing with him Lord and Lady Ingram and her two daughters, Sir George and Lady Lynn, oh, oh. Colonel Dent, of course, Mrs. Austin. The ladies will bring their maids and the gentlemen their valets. <laughs> oh, how are we going to feed them? Pies and pudding, where are we going to put them? <laughs> I can sleep in Adele's room. Oh, yes, we'll have to double up. Oh, what are you standing there looking stupid for? Come on, got work to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nice to see you. Mr. Rochester is showing John where the horses should be stabled. Oh, that journey is so tiring. Some refreshment would be nice. Oh, certainly. It'd be great pleasure. Later. Well, Mama, here we are. So, what do you think of Thornfield? A touch gloomy. There's great potential. Quite. A carpet and some decent pictures would make all the difference. We'll be in the drawing room, Mrs. One day I will be like Miss Ingram. Can we go downstairs, please? No, Adele. Why? When Mr. Rochester wants to see you, he'll ask for you. I was composed, prepared. I was sure that when Mr. Rochester walked through the door, I would feel detached. I would look at him and think how stupid I had been to let my heart become involved with someone above my station. Mrs. Fairfax was right. Blanche Ingram was beautiful. What a puppet! You must be Adele. Bonsoir, madame. And don't tell me, Adele. What have you been doing oh, while we've all been having dinner tonight? I've been dancing, madame. Dancing? Oh, isn't she adorable? Mama, have you ever seen anything quite so sweet? Not since you, my darling. <laughs> Everything about her was elegant sophisticated. She had everything. She could attract any man she liked. But she liked Mr. Rochester, my employer, who paid me 30 pounds per annum, and who had many, many faults. Too many. He thought himself superior. He was too proud, deeply sarcastic, and moody to the point of... of Edward. She is charming, like a little doll. But why then did I still love him? How on earth do you manage with her at home? You should send her to school. Well, school's far too expensive, Blanche. Besides, oh. she likes it here at Thornfield. Don't tell me you have a governess for her. Matter of fact, I do. Oh, Mama, close your ears. What do you think, dear? The mere mention of the word governess is enough to send Mama into hysteria. <laughs> We had at least a dozen. Most of them were either horrid or just plain stupid. <laughs> Mary, yeah. tell Edward how we teased Madame Joubert. She was so funny. <laughs> she used to fly into such a rage. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was very amusing. <laughs> Jane? Why have you left the room? Come back into the drawing room. Come on. To be insulted? Well, you're not pleased to see me, at least. Yes. Adele was so upset when you left without any warning, it's been difficult for her to concentrate. But I'm sure things will improve now that you're home. You look rather pale. Have you been ill? No, sir. A little depressed, perhaps? I guess we'll be wondering where you are. Good night, sir. Where are you going? To my room, sir. Jane! Jane! Well, tonight I excuse you. But from now on, I shall expect you in the drawing room every evening. Is that clear? Every evening, Jane! I wanted to run from the room, from Thornfield, from everything that reminded me of him. I wanted to cry out, why do you punish me when all I ever did was love you? Mason here, all the way from Jamaica. <laughs> Edward? Richard, please excuse me. Well, what are we to do now?
faint at the sight of blood. No, sir. Good. Give me your hand. Is it Grace Paul? Has she hurt herself? Fetch a doctor. Please, help me. She bit me and clawed at me like some... I warned you, but you wouldn't listen. I thought I could help. I don't need your help. Have some laudanum. It'll kill the pain. These wounds are deep. I must stop the bleeding. Tell you I need a doctor. She sucked the blood from my shoulder like a vampire. That's enough. You want to scare poor Miss Hare to death? We have no more talk on the subject. Now, drink. I get Tom to bring the carriage round. We need to get him to the doctor in the village as soon as possible. Will you stay with him? Of course I will. What would I do without you, Jane? I wanted to say you need never be without me. Blanche Ingram may well become his wife, but she would never be akin to him. Jane, what's the matter? I saw her. She came into the room. I saw Grace Paul, I swear. I felt sure she was going to kill him. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have left you alone. But you were perfectly safe, believe me. How can I be safe when she is left in this house? Nobody is safe while she is here. You must send her away. I will do something, I promise you. But put her out of your mind. I have to get him down to the carriage. Come on, Richard. Come on! Huh? Edward, let her be taken care of. Let her be treated tenderly. I'll do the best I can. The same as I always have. Away! of Grace Poole? Is he a relative of hers? Why do you ask so many questions, Jane? What does it matter who he is? I mean, watch the sunrise over Millcott Hill. Well, don't just stand there, Jane. If I was to ask you to do something that you thought was wrong, what then? It would depend. On what? 
what it was you were asking me to do. Say you're a young man abroad in a strange land and you happen to make a mistake. What kind of mistake? Not a crime, just an error of judgment. Yes. And years later, you get the chance of correcting that mistake. And the only thing that stands in your way is convention, formality. Would you take that chance? I don't quite understand what you mean. What I mean is, would you throw convention to the wind to achieve happiness? Tell me what you think. Only that I loved his face, his eyes, his mouth, his voice. He made me love him without even realizing it. Tell me. It depends what you mean by convention, by formality. If I had made a mistake, it would be my duty to bear the punishment. Duty? What the blaze is his duty, for heaven's sake? I would look to a higher plane for forgiveness. Of course, should have known. Brocklehurst teaching, no doubt. Whom do you mean, Jane? God? Tell me, when has God done anything for me? I wait for him, I wait forever. I've really wasted enough of my life. At long last, I know what I think. I know what is right. Then why ask me? Because... I needed to know. And now I have an answer. She's rising. I'm sorry I dragged you all the way out here, but I've missed our talks. So have I. Well, let's not argue then. Let's shake hands and be friends. Will you watch the sunrise again with me? You only have to ask. On the morning of my wedding. Are you to be married, sir? Oh, yes. I think it's about time, don't you? If you have met someone you wish to share your life with. I have. Miss Ingram is very beautiful. And clever, too. Brains and beauty, a lethal combination. And she happens to be desperately in love with my money. So, what do you think? I think you'll be very happy. I'll start looking for a post immediately. What are you talking about, a post? What post? Because if you're to marry, Adele should go to school. Miss Ingram has a particular dislike of governesses. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, there's no need for you to worry about finding a new post. You leave all that with me. Only if it's no trouble to you. It's no trouble at all. Jane. Look at me. I'm sorry, but I must go inside. I'm feeling quite cold. Oh, not so fast, Miss Eyre. I've been looking all over for you. you you've got a visitor waiting. Me? She's in the library. Miss Eyre? You've grown up into such a lady. Who'd ever have thought it? Lovely to see you. Oh. How is everybody? Oh. Don't start me off. You 
cousin John is dead. And your aunt is taken badly. It's nearly a hundred miles away, Jane. I'm sorry, but that is where my aunt lives and she's been asking for me. Very well. You may go. But I want you back in a week. Not a day longer, do you hear? Seven days, and if you're not back then, I'll come and fetch you. Thank you, sir. Edward? I've been outmaneuvered, my dear Blanche. Game to her. I thought you might explain the concept of the 28-day week to me. I'm sorry, but things weren't quite as straightforward as I'd hoped. Really? I had to help my cousins with my aunt's funeral arrangements. Oh, never mind me. Who am I to worry about? I had thought that you could deduct the money from my salary. So you have given me some thought. Thank you very much. Yes. Good. I'm sorry about your aunt. Not one single letter did you send me. Mrs. Fairfax had a letter. Adele and Sophie had a letter. No doubt even Pilot had a letter, but oh no, not me. That was too much to ask. The whole of Thornfield was chattering with news of your return. But I, the master of the house, had to learn from Mrs. Fairfax that you were due home today. I've already been up at the village twice to see if the coach had arrived. I see at long last I've found something to make you laugh. I am so pleased my distress amuses you. It is not your distress that amuses me, sir. It is the thought of writing to Pilot. I can assure you, I did not send Pilot a letter. I'm sorry I did not write to you, but I thought you would be preoccupied with other things. Oh, did you now? Yes. Michel! 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 Welcome home, my dear. I missed you. Oh, oh she you. did. It's been so boring here without you. Mm. Surely not with all the other nice ladies and gentlemen here to entertain you. So you went the day after you'd gone. Jane. Yes. Will you walk with me? Oh, she must unpack. She'll want to get her things hung up. It's such a lovely evening. Well, there's a storm brewing up, I think. Perhaps just a little stroll then. I'll get your bag. It's a beautiful place in autumn. It is a beautiful place all year round. Well, I hope you like Ireland as much. Ireland? Yes. Remember I promised to find your position? Well, I have. It's with the Mrs. Dionysus of Gaul of Bitternut Lodge, Connie Farthington, Ireland. And you start next week. Next week? But Ireland is so far away. Oh, you love it, Jane. And they say the people are very friendly there. Yes, but I won't be able to see. Who? Adele? Mrs. Fairfax? Is that all? Isn't there anyone else you miss? And you, sir? 
It's a shame, because we have been good friends, haven't we? I mean, sometimes I feel like I have known you all my life. I know this may sound silly, but when we're together like this, I feel like, well, I'm sort of attached to you. It's as though I've got a bit of string somewhere under my left ribs, about here. And it's not a tour, similar piece of string situated about there. Do you think that piece of string will stretch 200 miles across the sea, Jane? Or do you think we'll end up bleeding inwardly for each other? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. You'll probably forget me as soon as you set foot in Ireland. I will never forget you as long as I live. Do you think because I am poor and plain I have no soul, no heart? Well, you are wrong. My time here at Thornfield has been the happiest of my entire life. It will break my heart to leave. I've talked and laughed and learned so much by just being here. I've loved every moment of it, from teaching Adele to the wonderful conversations we've had together. I am your equal, and you have treated me as such. You have shown true respect for me, and I have felt for the first time in my entire life like I've belonged. And to think that I will soon be torn from all this, that I will never speak with you or see your face again, is unbearable to me. Then why go? Because your bride will not want me here. I have no bride. Not yet. But you will have. Yes. You're right, I will. Come here. Let go of me. I can't stay here and watch you marry her. You're absolutely right. A woman you don't love. That's correct. A woman who is not worthy of you. It would be less helpful to go to Ireland, so please let go of me. What if I don't want to? What if I want you right here by my side forever? I'm afraid your bride stands between us, so. My bride is here. If you have me, I offer you my heart, my hand in marriage, and a share of all my worldly possessions. Will you marry me, Jane? I love you. I've always loved you since the first time we met, that's why. But how can that be? Oh, that don't torture me. Answer me, Jane. Will you be my wife? Will you make me the happiest man on this earth? The next morning when I woke, I feared it had all been a dream. Mrs Fairfax, have you seen Mr Rochester this morning? Oh, he was off an hour past seven. Do you know where he has gone? Oh, I don't ask. The law unto himself is that one. Adele's had her breakfast. She's in the library having a sock. Doesn't want to do any more mathematics. Good morning. Oh, speak of the devil. The storm last night has freshened the air. And the grass is as green as anything. Good morning, Mr. Rochester. Edward. You look so beautiful this morning. Radiant. Mrs. Rochester. Good morning, Adele. Can we do some painting today, Miss Eyre? No, today is a holiday. Miss Eyre and I are going into Millcott so that she can choose some new dress. And me? <laughs> Not this time, Adele.
Jane and I are going alone, but I shall bring you back a petit cadeau. How's that? Oh, oui! A cadeau! Don't change, Jane. Give it one. Au revoir. Good, dearest. How nice to see you. Good day, Blanche. And the governess. Soon to be Mrs. Rochester. How quaint. Well, congratulations. No doubt you've a whole trousseau to buy. I'm afraid we're a bit limited here in Millcote. It's all a bit dull. But I'm sure you'll find something. At least suitable for honeymoon in Italy and France. Lovely. You know Archibald, of course. Lord Granby. Arrivederci. <laughs> Whatever did you see in her? The means to make you jealous. That's truly wicked. But it worked. <laughs> and what for a veil? Just something simple. French lace with pearls. A plain net. This one will do. The finest French lace with pearls. I'll get married in this if you continue. All right, we'll take both of them and the silks. You don't understand. I want to show the world what a beauty you are. I am not a beauty. I am Jane Eyre, and I have everything I want right here. Wrap them. As time passed and my wedding day drew near, the house was full of excitement. Everyone seemed genuinely delighted for me, except Mrs. Fairfax. I thought perhaps she didn't approve of a young governess marrying her employer, but I wasn't going to let that spoil my newfound happiness. For the day after tomorrow, I would be his wife. been a dream, Jane. Now, what do you think of this colour? Does it suit me? It's very nice. Edward, the veil is ripped in two. I can bring it down. You can see for yourself. But I've told you, you have to keep your door locked at night. Let's be careful with the likes of Grace pull around. Now, I have bought you a present. Edward, you said you were going to let Grace Poole go. Well, I've made inquiries. And if I throw her out, the only place left for her is the asylum. And she has served this family very well, Jane. How can I do that? How can I sentence her to a life at Bedlam? You can't. But how can you leave her in this house with Adele? Surely it's only a matter of time before a tragedy occurs. Please, now stop worrying about her. I have spoken with Mrs. Fairfax and she's going to arrange something. And after tomorrow, we're going to be thousands of miles away traveling the world. Grace Poole will be no more than a memory. And it means you'll get your own way after all. You'll be able to wear that flimsy piece of muslin you wanted to in the first place. Now, come on, stop frowning. Let me see you smile. I want you to be happy. Now, look. I 
I don't need gifts, Edward. Your love is all I need. But you know you have all of that. And I like to give you presents. Besides, I have a right to. You're going to be my wife. And the next present I shall give you shall be your wedding ring. Now, watch. Edward, it's lovely. I knew you'd like it. I'm so happy. You have made me so happy. Tell me that you love me. Go on. I want to hear you say it. I love you with all my heart. Do you approve, Mrs. Fairfax? Take my little blue pin. For luck. Thank you. I will make him happy. I require and charge you, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if there be any impediment why these two persons may not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. Marry us, then. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. I require and charge you both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. An impediment. Proceed! Mr. Rochester is already married! The man's an imbecile! Carry on! I'm obliged to listen to the accusation. I have the wedding certificate here of Edward Rochester of Thornfield Hall and my sister, Bertha Antoinetta Mason of Spanish Town, Jamaica. And is she still living? Yes! I saw her with my own eyes not three months ago. No! I'm sorry. But it's not right. Edward. I tell you, he has a wife. Wife. You dare to call her that? Wife! Follow me in and introduce her to my wife! Get back to work. Take the child to her room. Grace, open the door. Are you sure, sir? 
say you know what I can last I said stand. open the door! For sake, sir, take care! They, they will not harm you. These people will not harm you. And they have not come to take you away. How are you feeling? No, Bertha. No. Get off him! What did I tell you, sir? Hold it down. I've got her. I've got her. Oh, oh, ah! Bertha! That is who Mr. Mason calls my wife. You married her, Edward. I was tricked into it by your family in Jamaica. They showed her off to me at parties, but I was never allowed to see her alone, talk to her properly. I was dazzled by her beauty. It was only after the wedding that I realized that she was insane. Like her mother and her grandmother before her, and I tried everything in my power to make her well. I hired the best doctors. I sought alternative methods, and then finally, I realized that there was no cure. I could have run away back to England and left her there. But instead, I brought her home with me. And not to have her chained up in some lunatic asylum, as some would have it, but to keep her safe here at Thornfield. With a nurse, day and night, to tend to every need. But you must have known you couldn't marry Miss Eyre when you were already married. It would have been a crime. You would have been committing bigamy, sir. Do you blame me when well, all I wanted was to be with this woman. I would have done anything to be with her. I have been a torment for 15 years. And can you stand there and honestly judge me when you see in front of you this poor wretch to whom I am bound for life? You. I'll pray for you, Mr. Rochester. You can keep your prayers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, only that Grace Poole had a patient. I, I thought it was little Adele's mother. I had no idea it was Mr. Rochester's wife. At last, I've been waiting for you. Oh, we're leaving, I see. Didn't I just know you'd desert me? Really, Jane, you are so predictable. Couldn't you be just a little more original? I'm talking to you. Where are you going? Away, sir. Where? Please let go of my arm. Not until you tell me where you're going. I do not know where I'm going. No, oh, anywhere, so long as it's far away from me, is that it? And why? I'll tell you why. Because you were only interested in becoming Mrs. Rochester, that's why. Please give me my back. Oh, you were never in love with me, Jane. You were in love with the idea of being mistress of Thorfinn. Admit it. You're no better than Blanche Ingram, running away like a spoiled child. I mean, you can't hide your way. I thought you were mature, but you're just a child who has no idea what real love is. I would have done anything for you. Anything. I was prepared 
to commit bigamy because I knew that being married was important to you. And they could have thrown me in prison, I wouldn't have cared. But I just wanted to make you happy. Please let go of my arms. Look me in the eyes and tell me you don't love me and you can walk free. Say it. No. Better still. Here, where you poured out your heart to me. Look me in the face and tell me all that was a lie. It's not me who's told the lies. I have no secret husband. I have always been honest with you. I've always wanted to be honest with you, Jane, but how could I tell you when I knew it would drive all happiness away from me? Look at me, Jane. Tell me you don't love me, and you can go. I can't tell you that, because I do love you. I wanted to be your wife because I love you, not for any other reason. And I love you more than I've ever loved anyone Please in my whole life. Please don't say that. Why not, if it's the truth? You must never say it to me again, and I must never say it to you. It is wrong. But how can it be wrong when the two of us love each other as we do? It is wrong for us not to be together. I am a plain, living person, Mr. Rochester. Oh, Mr. I Rochester, I wanted someone who I could love honestly and decently, and someone who could love me back properly. Well, it doesn't I, matter who I, it is. I is that I had that with you, but I was wrong. You led me to believe you were one person, but you were really another. I am the same as I always was. The same heart, the same mind. You are a married man! But I'm still me! And when we danced together, happy and carefree in the drawing room, all the time you knew your wife was locked up there. How could you? What would you have me do, Jane? Devote the rest of my life to her? I could never trust you again. So you're going to punish me instead? Condemn me to live wretched and die a curse. Do you think this is easy for me? Do you think I am happy to see you suffering when every nerve in my body is telling me to comfort you? If I could find a way in my soul of reconciling this situation, I would in a moment. But I cannot throw away any respect I have for myself because my heart is tempted. You have a wife. You belong to another. I belong to you. And you belong to me. We are one soul, Jane. Please help me. Please don't say that. Please help me to be strong. If you only knew how much I love you. Kiss me. I need you, Jane. You want me. I can feel your passions are aroused. Say you want me. Say it. No, I can't. How can I lie with you knowing that I am not your wife? Or we simply go abroad and we tell people you are my wife. Who's to know any different? Me! I will know it. I would have to live with my own conscience, and that would eat away at my soul till I was no longer Jane Eyre, but some embittered mistress who you resented being with. I am worth more than that. I would never, never resent being with you, Jane. Leaving you will be the most painful thing I have ever had to endure. But I would rather die and watch the love we have twist into something ugly. I am leaving for us, Edward, for what we have. Not for me, Jane. You're leaving for yourself. And if that's how you truly feel, then go. Go on. That's it. Walk away. You think what we have is nothing? Well, let me tell you, this is the greatest, purest love you will ever find. And I should know. I've searched long enough for it. left Thornfield with little money or means to survive. I asked the coachman to take me as far as the 20 shillings I had would allow. I travelled for two days with not a care whether I should live or die, but the further I went, the closer I felt his presence.
think she's waking, Diana. Looks as though her fever has broken. The Lord has looked after her. He has plans for her yet. Poor little soul. I wonder what happened to her. No doubt she's endured great suffering. What is your name? Jane Essa. Can we send for anyone you know? There is no one. Well, Jane. My name is Sinchin. This is my sister Diana. Hope you're feeling better. You gave me quite a scare when I saw you lying on the ground. My first two months with Sinjin and Diana were simple and uncomplicated. The more I got to know them, the more I liked them. Morehouse has been a different place since you arrived. It's very kind. I must find some employment. I've worked as a teacher, so I must be able to find something. A teacher? Don't Sinjin. Well? If she's strong enough to work. Home time. You play very well. A little. That's what all the schoolgirls say. What's the matter? Nothing. I suddenly remembered something, that's all. I never ask you much about your past life, Jane. Because I know when you're ready, you, you'll tell me everything. But I want you to know, whatever difficulties there have been in your life, the work you're doing now is wonderful. I've watched you carefully over these past few months. The children respond to you. No task is too great, and your patience and understanding of people is it's unique. I wish that were true. Other people have a different opinion of me, I'm sure. It is the truth. Believe me. Dear Mrs. Fairfax, it has been some time now since I wrote to you last asking for news of Adele and Mr. Rochester, and still I have had no reply. There's a storm brewing out there. Been threatening all day. Yeah. What are you reading, Jane? Anything interesting? A book on German. I'm trying to learn the language. What for? You planning on travelling? I have no plans as yet, but I would like to see more of the world. I'll give you a book on Hindustani. You could learn that instead. India is a fascinating country. Tell him no. Stick to the German. <laughs> I'm studying the language myself. We could learn together. Study what you like and don't be bullied by him. Perhaps I could learn Hindustani as well as Jan. <laughs> well, I must go to bed. I've got an early start. Good night, brother. Good night, sister. <laughs> Good night, Diana. Stick to the German. I know Diana thinks I'm a bit of a bully sometimes. Let me be honest with you. The real reason I'd like you to learn Hindustani, Jane, is because, well, in six months' time, I set sail for India to do God's work there. And I would dearly love you to come with me. I'm flattered. I don't know what to say. Your help would be invaluable to me. 
I've been meaning to ask you for some time, but I knew you were busy at the school and I didn't want to distract you from what you were doing. I'm not sure I'm capable of that kind of work. You are, Jane. Trust me. I know you could do it. Yes, the work will be strenuous, but when have you been afraid of that? You have endurance, Jane. You will make a perfect missionary's wife. Wife? You hardly know me. I know, well, I need to. You were sent to me, don't you understand? This is what we are to do in life. We will work together, side by side. I respect and admire It was true. So Fate had taken me to St. John, and hadn't he cared for me, given me the opportunities to prove myself? He was a good man. He would make a considerate Please, husband. What more could me. I want? I knew St. John could never love me, but hadn't love only brought me pain? I love you more than I've ever loved anybody in my whole life. If I left England, perhaps I would leave the memories of Edward Rochester behind. Maybe this was the way to put him out of my mind forever. You know in your heart is right. I'm confused. My heart won't speak to me. Then I will speak for it. You will marry me and come to India where we will do God's work together. Say yes. Say yes. Say it. Jane! Edward! Jane! Where are you? Wait, but I am coming! all night. You could see black smoke billowing for miles. Edward. Mrs. Rochester escaped from her nurse and set fire to the place. She panicked, ran up onto the roof. We could see her dancing amidst the flames, screaming. It was terrible. And Mr. Rochester? Mr. Rochester got his young ward and the servants out of the house then went up on the roof after Mrs. Rochester. He did his best to save her, but she jumped to her death. Unfortunately, he was on his way back down when the staircase gave way, and he fell. Is that you, Mrs. Fairfax? Did you get some water for me? Mrs. Fairfax? Yes, Mr. Rochester. May I have the water, please? Pleasure. Jane, is that you? Dear God, I'm going mad. 
You are not mad, sir. I'm dreaming. Never let me wake. Mr. Jane's lips, her cheek, her little fingers. And her voice. You are not dreaming. I am truly here. Oh, my own sweet Jane. I have come back. I will be your companion, your nurse, your eyes. I don't want a companion. Neither do I want a nurse. I might have known. So you have come back to take pity on a poor blind man. Is that it? Who told you? No one told me. I have thought about you every day since I left. I have fought my emotions and I cannot fight them any longer. I've traveled for two days without stopping and when I saw Thornfield I feared that... A ruin. Like myself. You are no lifeless ruin, sir. You are wounded, but still full of life and vigor. Edward. So, he didn't find a husband then. I met someone who wanted to marry me. No doubt he's young and handsome. Yes. And he's a good and honorable man. So why are you here then? Why aren't you with him? I came to see you. Well, take a good look. Think how lucky you are. There was a narrow escape. You could have been married to this hideous, blind wreck. I can think of nothing better. Your visit is very much appreciated, Jane. But I think it is best if you go now. For go you shall. And it would be less painful on the heart if it was sooner rather than later. I will not go. You can say what you want. I will never leave your side again. If you throw me out of this house, then I will pound against the door until you let me in. Don't you understand? I want no other. I love you. How can you love me like this? Do not speak these words out of pity, Jane. What good am I to you? How can I take care of you? It is a pity to see your poor, wounded face. But you are not your wounds. The danger is that I will love you too much. For you are everything that matters in the world to me, Edward. Jane. <laughs> My heart will burst. I want to see your face. Touch it. Here. See with your hands. I've come home, Edward. I will never leave you again. I've been married to Edward ten years now, and I love him as much today as the day I returned to Thornfield and saw him wounded and helpless. In our third year together, he regained the sight in his right eye, and when our firstborn was put into his arms, he could see his own likeness. I am truly blessed, for I now know what it is to have found love.